If you thought involving affordable sports cars belonged back in history, then you'll find Toyota's GT86 a welcome breath of fresh air. Developed and desired by enthusiasts, it's a benchmark in the compact coupe sector, a masterclass in driving dynamics. They knew what sports cars were back in the 50s. Not a lot of power, not a lot of grip, and an awful lot of fun. If you see that as the classic automotive era, then it may be that you're not quite up to date with the quality of performance machines in the time that you live in. Now, some of them are supercars, but not all. Here, for example, is a classic in the making that you may very well be able to put on your own driveway. Its name, Toyota's GT86. For too long, enthusiasts have believed what the car makers have told them that they needed more power, more grip, more fancy intervening electronics. It all looked good on paper, but was often curiously unsatisfying out on the road. Time to go back to basics, which is exactly what Toyota has done with this car, the Hakiroku, which translates as 8.6 in Japanese. Four factors governed its development. Light weight, modest, normally aspirated power, rear-wheel drive and narrow tyres. Lap times are unimportant. What matters is driving enjoyment. And you might have forgotten just how much of a heritage affordable Toyota sports cars have in providing that, from the tiny S800 of 1962 to the GT2000 of later that decade, the Celica of the 70s and the mid-engined MR2 of the 80s. There's not been much since then, but press and public alike seem convinced that the 2012 launch of this GT86 marked a turning point that was worth the wait. Are they right? Let's find out. So, what's it like? Well, let's push the start button, snick it into first gear and find out. Right away, I have to start with the fundamentals. There's a beautiful symmetry to this car, even when it comes to the statistics. A 2,000cc engine puts out around 200 brake horsepower, uh, whilst developing just over 200 newton meters of torque to pull along a total weight of just over 1,200 kilograms. Then there's the 86s, a reference to Toyota's legendary AE86 drift car and a figure that just happens to be the exact millimetric dimension of the engine's bore and stroke, and the precise diameter of the chrome-tipped exhausts through which it breathes. The power plant in question isn't Toyota's. This car you see comes out of a joint venture with Subaru, whose near identical BRZ model provides the high revving flat four that sits beneath the bonnet, selected because it was small, light, and could be mounted nearer to the ground for an ultra low center of gravity, which is why on the move, your rear end feels like it's skimming inches along the tarmac. In this car, you're an integral part of the performance package, much as you would be in a go-kart and it's a package you really have to work if you're gonna make meaningful progress. You see, like all boxer engines, this one has to be revved and revved hard before it'll deliver, which is why on a test drive around the block, this Toyota won't really feel very fast at all. Nothing much starts to happen until you get to about six and a half thousand RPM, but from there on, you enter a twilight zone where the car just hurls itself towards the horizon until you get to a nosebleed 7,450 RPM. The soundtrack here could be better. Chief engineer Tetsuya Tada says he wants to improve it, but it's pleasing enough to accompany a rest of 60 time of 7.6 seconds on the way to a top speed of 140 miles an hour. That's around a second and 10 miles an hour slower than a comparable two litre turboed Volkswagen Sirocco or Audi TT. But don't be underwhelmed by those figures. As I've said, this car isn't about numbers or lap times or top trumps comparisons. It's about tactility. True, it may lose the odd traffic light Grand Prix to a comparably powered front-ranking hot hatch, but I'd wager that the average GT86 buyer won't care. Here's why it's so good. 
First, the driving position. As I've said, you sit low down, grasping the smaller steering wheel that Toyota fits to any production car. One position nicely upright so you can uh, flick easily through the corners from lock to lock without any trouble. You'll also be flicking from gear to gear through the six-speed manual transmission, one that Toyota spent simply ages trying to get right. They have. It's brilliant. Please don't spoil things by specifying the sprint sapping six-speed automatic. On the kind of twisty back roads that you'll be seeking out with this car, there's a suppleness to the suspension that might surprise those expecting a raw drift machine. But the GT86 actually rides with a really expensive polish. Then there's the steering. Before I drove Porsche's seventh generation 911, I'd really doubted whether any electric power steering system could really match the feel of a good hydraulic setup. Now that car changed my mind, and this one is even better, brilliantly communicating what the front wheels are doing at any given time and exactly how much grip you have to play with. Ah oh yes, the grip. I was coming to that. There's not a lot. And you wouldn't expect there to be, given that quite intentionally, the engineers have specified this car to run on the same skinny tyres as a feeble Toyota Prius. Now, this won't do much for your lap times on a track day at Silverstone, but it's a brilliant recipe for fun on every deserted roundabout, especially in the wet, where power slides are yours for the asking. Here, you can adjust your line with your right foot in a way that comparable sports coupes could only dream about, safe in the knowledge that there's a mechanical limited slip differential and an advanced three-stage stability control system to gather things up should you be one of those with more ambition than skill. And that's perhaps the best thing about this car, one that performance driving novices and experts alike will get an awful lot from, which isn't an easy trick to pull off. At first glance, you might wonder what all the fuss is about. The styling's smart, but hardly show-stopping, uh, with the classic front-engine, rear-drive concept delivering the usual long bonnet and rear set cabin. It's all a little different from the final prototype, the FT86 II show car that uh, Toyota unveiled at the 2011 Geneva Motor Show, 12 months before production started at Subaru's Gunmar plant in Japan. Their GT86 models roll down exactly the same production lines as their Subaru BRZ counterparts. The only real difference between the two cars aesthetically being this trapezoidal front grille section. And of course, the lovely detailing. Take this 86 badge on the flank, featuring a pair of horizontally opposed pistons and a representation of four tires in what's claimed to be a perfect four-wheel drift. Already, you've got the idea behind this car and uh, of Toyota's enthusiasm for it. Hardly anything in this design is shared with any other Toyota model, an almost unheard of approach in this day and age. Everything about it is geared around driving, even the quality of the cabin where heavyweight, high quality plastics are mostly notable by their absence. On the move, you'll notice that soundproofing has been kept to a minimum too, all in the interests of saving weight. If you don't like that, succumb to driving boredom and buy an Audi TT. I know which I'd rather have. In any case, what this cabin lacks in luxury appointment, it makes up for in detailed delicacy. Take these soft knee pads built into the door trim and the centre console to offer extra support when cornering hard or this little dashboard moulding built onto the centre of the dash top and reflecting in the windscreen so that you can more accurately position the centre of the car when it's oversteering. Combine all this with a lovely three dial instrument pack and the best driving position you could possibly imagine and you've got a design that will delight every proper petrol head. It's a two plus two so you get these tiny rear seats that motoring journalists without young children usually moan about, but I find quite useful, if only for slinging a jacket onto. And a reasonably sized boot. Or it is, at least if you fold the back seats down to extend 
the standard 243 litre capacity to uh, a space so usable that it will accommodate a trolley jack and four replacement wheels and tyres. Ideal for track types then. You'll pay around £25,000 for the manual model, with the automatic gearbox adding about £1,500 to that. Uh, you're looking, therefore, at almost exactly the same kind of money that Subaru will ask of you for their virtually identical BRZ model. Now, to put those prices into some kind of perspective, you're looking at a little more than you pay for a Peugeot RCZ THP200, but a little less than uh, you'd pay for a comparable Volkswagen Sirocco GT 2.0-litre TSI or a uh, BMW 120i Coupe M Sport, and a couple of thousand less than you'd pay for a, a comparable Audi TT 2.0-litre TFSI. In terms of hot hatches, well, the money Toyota's asking would get you a Volkswagen Golf GTI, but it's a couple of thousand less than you'd pay for something like uh, a Vauxhall Astra VXR. Though from launch there was no choice when it came to body style or engine output, there are plenty of personalisation uh, options with black or silver decal packs for the side, the roof and the bonnet. Uh, you also get to choose a lovely black leather and red Alcantara upholstery pack that personally I'd go for every time. Most owners will also want to update the uh, Toyota Touch infotainment system to touch and go status so that it includes a satellite navigation setup able to give you speed camera warnings, uh, useful that in this car, and uh, a Google local search function that on the move can update you with everything from local fuel prices, parking information, even weather forecasts. The kit list includes most of what you'll want, lovely 17-inch uh, light alloy wheels, chrome-tipped dual exhaust pipes, uh, bi-xenon headlamps, LED daytime running lights, front fog lamps, metallic paint, electric folding mirrors, uh, while inside you get sports seats, a neat aluminium pedal set, an auto-dimming rear view mirror, dual zone climate control, uh, a six speaker CD stereo with USB connectivity, uh, Bluetooth compatibility for your mobile phone, uh, cruise control, and uh, a lovely um, leather finish with contrasting red stitching for the steering wheel, the gear stick, and the handbrake lever. Safety wise, there's a dynamic stability control system with three modes. Uh, ABS brakes with the usual brake assist and electronic brake force distribution, hill start assist, uh, twin front, side and curtain airbags plus a driver's knee airbag, a decoupling brake pedal mechanism and Isofix child seat fastenings in the rear. Now you might be tempted by this car, then wonder if a GT86 is going to cost an arm and a leg in depreciation over your intended ownership period compared to something with a premium badge, say uh, an Audi TT. A car with four rings on the bonnet just has to be a safer home for your money, right? Wrong, as it happens. An entry-level TT uh, will retain just 49% of its original value over a three-year ownership period. A BMW 120i Coupe, just 43%. A Toyota GT86, Try 58% for size. Uh, huge customer demand has swelled residual values healthily, and that's not going to disappear overnight. In fact, I don't think there's been a car launched in recent years that has been aimed at the used market quite like this GT86. Uh, the model's chief engineer, Tetsuya Tada, uh, has gone as far as urging Toyota to ensure that the first model sold reach the used car market as soon as possible so that young people can buy them second hand and customise them to their tastes. And there'll be plenty of that in future years. All the specs and development plans for this car have already been released by Toyota to tuners and aftermarket equipment developers to create the kind of momentum that Toyota hope will uh, engender a, a GT86 cult. In fact, Tada-san rude the fact that the GT86 had to be quite so expensive in the first place, but at the same time didn't want to compromise and create a half-baked product clearly built down to a cost. And the news keeps on getting better when you examine day-to-day -day running costs. This GT86 is reasonably economical. 
Yes, I know the published figures are usually a bit of a farce that you can never actually get near, but Toyota quotes a combined cycle fuel return of 36.2 miles to the gallon. And everyone I've uh, known who's run one of these has averaged over 30 miles to the gallon in it. And I know quite a few leadfoots, I can assure you. Emissions of 181 grams per kilometer of CO2 aren't quite so clever, but they do improve uh, rather surprisingly if you go for the six-speed automatic which returns 164 grams per kilometer. Uh, add to this a, an excellent after-sales package which includes Toyota's five-year uh, 100,000 mile warranty and there's not a lot not to like. Could this car be any better? Well, we're going to find out in future because Toyota is planning to bring us a whole stream of derivations. I'm not sure though that any of them will be significantly better than this, the original. Of course, it could be uh, faster, grippier, quieter and a better quality inside. Personally though, I'm not sure I'd really want it to be. All of those things would dilute the very qualities that make this GT86 what it is. Sports cars always used to be this way, light, low powered and modestly rubbered. We had fun in them then and we can have fun in this one now. The chassis is excellent, the controls are brilliant, the driving position nigh on perfect and the engine, if not orally exciting, is revvy and willing. So what we have here is something to savour, one of those rare machines that involves you so much that you don't have to be travelling at three figure speeds to have fantastic fun. Factor in the affordable running costs and the high residuals and you have a very tempting proposition indeed. In years to come, it'll be a landmark car for Toyota. And if you buy one now, you'll have the eternal bragging rights that come with getting there first. You won't regret it.